Thank you very much. Um, so one of the main objects uh, that was recognized by this prize uh, is called uh, prismatic cohomology. Um, in this presentation, I will not be able to tell you what prismatic cohomology is. Uh, that would take too long. Um, but instead, my goal is to give you uh, a sense of the mathematical environment in which uh, prismatic cohomology lives and what are the kinds of problems uh, it helps you solve. Um, and in fact, one of the main problems it helps you solve is the problem of distinguishing spaces, which is the title of the presentation. So let me begin with spaces. Uh, spaces mean uh, very different things in mathematics. In fact, every subfield of mathematics can be regarded as a study of a space of a certain kind. Uh, I want to tell you about the spaces I'm interested in. Uh, so let me give you um, some examples of how spaces arise in mathematics. Um, so the first way you might encounter a space in mathematics is just in the wild. You could just draw it or you could picture it. Uh, here's an example. Uh, it's called the Mobius band, uh, and it looks like so. Uh, it's very easy to build the space. I mean, I've drawn a picture for you, uh, but also you can just do it by hand. You take a cylindrical piece of paper and you try to glue it to itself. But at the end, instead of gluing the two ends in the obvious way, you twist them once. And what you get is a Mobius band and it has some uh, nice properties. Um, another example uh, of a space, maybe a much simpler example, uh, is the two-dimensional sphere, as mathematicians like to call it, or as children like to call it, a ball. Uh, here's a picture of a ball. It could be, you know, any kind of ball. It's, but I want to emphasize that it's two-dimensional, so I'm only thinking of it in terms of its outside. Uh, it doesn't have the interior. Um, okay. And then I wanted to give one more example of a space arising in the wild, uh, which is uh, the technical name for it is a Riemann surface of genus two. Here's what it looks like. Um, now, it might be a little hard to actually uh, encounter the space in the wild. Uh, but for example, if you're baking uh, something like donuts and something went wrong, or you're trying to make menduwaras and something went wrong, then you will probably end up with a space like this. Uh, so these are some. Um, naturally occurring examples of spaces. Uh, but my experience is that in math, at least, spaces do not arise uh, by just drawing pictures or building a space. Instead, they arise in a more conceptual way. The points of the space have some intrinsic meaning. Um, and so here's an example uh, of what I mean. So one of the most important spaces in math is uh, Rn. Uh, it's the n, it's an n-dimensional vector space over the real numbers. Concretely, it's just n-tuples of uh, numbers. Uh, it's a space that everyone has seen before in school. Uh, if you're drawing uh, the graph of a function y equals f of x, you're drawing something in a two-dimensional space uh, in R2. Um, a more sophisticated example, which you might have seen in college, is uh, the graph of a function of two variables, and then it would be sitting inside R3. R3 is the world we live in. Um, so Rn is kind of a fundamental example. Here's a slightly uh, more interesting example, uh, which is uh, what I call conf2. So it's pairs uh, x and y uh, of numbers which are not equal to each other. So it's essentially the same as R2. Uh, you have two numbers, x and y, uh, but there's a condition, and the condition is that x is not equal to y. Uh, and so how would you draw such a space? Well, it's actually very easy. You look at R2, which is, uh, as I said before, a plane, but now you want to impose a condition, and the condition is that you're not on the diagonal. The diagonal is the set of points where x equals y, so you remove the diagonal, and you get kind of this disconnected space with two components, uh, and that's the space uh, conf2. Um, OK, and I wanted to mention one more example of a, of a space arising conceptually, because it's one of the most important spaces in math. Uh, it's a projective space. Um, so more precisely, here I'm talking about RP2. So this is the space of lines in R3 that go through 0. A line in R3 going through zero is something I pictured over here. This vector uh, is, an, if you extend it out to infinity, it's a line going through zero. But now the space RP2 is the space of such lines. So you have to think about all possible lines uh, in R3 that go through zero and organize that into a space. It's a little hard to visualize uh, what this looks like. Uh, one attempt of doing so is the following. So let's first draw a ball uh, that goes through uh, a ball of radius one uh, around the origin. And then uh, for every point on the ball, you can draw a line connecting it to the origin and extend it out. And so this gives you a line through the origin. Every line through the origin arises in this fashion, but you overcount it. Uh, there are two points that give you the same line, which is a point and its antipodal point. They draw the same line. 
And so what you really want to do is you want to look at all points on the ball and then um, identify two points with each other if they're antipodes. Um, and so what you formally want to do is you want to look at certain kinds of a quotient space. So it's a ball modulus some equivalence relation, which identifies these two points together. It's slightly abstract. Um, it's hard to picture, and there's a good reason it's hard to picture. Uh, this space actually does not embed inside R3. It doesn't live in the three-dimensional world. So if you wanted to picture it somewhere, you would have to live in a higher dimensional world. Um, OK, so these are conceptual examples. Uh, and finally, let me come to uh, the spaces I actually care about, which are uh, solution sets of equations. So I'm an algebraic geometer, and algebraic geometry is the study of spaces that arise as solution sets of equations. And so what do I mean by this? Uh, here's a simple example. Uh, here's an equation x squared plus y squared equals 9. Uh, I can look at the set of all x and y that solve this equation. Uh, and if you plot it, uh, it looks, as you might expect, like a circle. It's a circle of radius 3 uh, around the origin. Um, OK. Now you can just write down equations willy-nilly, and there's tons of them. Uh, there's some method to the madness of how you go about caring about certain equations over the others. And one of the ones that turned out to historically be quite important uh, was discovered in the 1860s by Coomer. So it's called the Coomer portic. Here's a picture of what it looks like. Uh, if you care about the equations, you can either zoom in for these slides and look at the equation down here, or you can Google for it. I will not tell you more about it right now. Uh, but I just wanted to give one more example uh, before uh, moving on, uh, and it's the following. Uh, so it's the set of all x, y, and z uh, that satisfy the equation z times x minus y equals 1. Uh, OK, so why did I pick this equation? Um, I picked it because there's something uh, you can observe here. So first of all, the fact that z times x minus y is 1 tells you that x minus y can never be 0. Once you know that x minus y is never 0, you can actually solve for z. z is equal to 1 over x minus y. So another way of writing the space is that you just forget about the z, and you just look at pairs x and y such that x is not equal to y. And so that's actually our familiar uh, uh, space of uh, configuration space from the previous page. It's pairs of real numbers, x and y, which are not equal to each other. Um, and so the reason I mentioned this example um, is twofold. Uh, one is that it tells you uh, that the space cont2, which showed up in a very conceptual way on the previous page, is actually an example of a solution set of a system of equations. Uh, and actually, that's true for every space I've drawn for you so far. It's given by the solution set of some equations. Um, and secondly, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is um, this is a slightly funny uh, identification. It required a little bit of cleverness uh, in observing something about the shape of this equation. Uh, and that actually brings me uh, to the general problem, which is how do you distinguish spaces? If I give you two spaces, x and y, is there a way to tell that some clever relabeling of one space gives you another space? Um, and this is a hard problem. It's a problem that mathematicians have tackled for many, many years, centuries, in fact. Um, we have some tools for dealing with it, but it's a hard problem. Um, and so one of the best tools we've come up with for handling uh, cases of this problem is called singular cohomology. Um, this is something that dates back, again, to the 1800s. Um, uh, maybe the easiest way to summarize it is the following uh, construction of Betty, uh, who was a mathematician in the 1870s. Uh, and what he did is he attached invariants uh, to a space. So given a space x and two auxiliary parameters, one is an integer i and one is a prime number p, uh, Betty attached an invariant, which is just a number, uh, bi of x, comma p, uh, to the space. In fact, his number is actually the dimension of some other vector space, but let's forget about that. So to each uh, space x, Betty, and integer i, uh, Betty assigns a number, uh, which also depends on this prime number p, which is bi. And the rough intuition is that bi is counting the number of i-dimensional holes in your space. So for example, a circle has a one-dimensional hole in the middle, a uh, ball has a two-dimensional hole in the middle, and so on. But there's a way to make this mathematically precise, which is uh, what these uh, Betty numbers are doing. Um, this prime number p is showing up as an auxiliary parameter. And it's a little hard to say what it's doing just by looking at the construction. I'll try to say a little bit more about it as we go on. Um, but I wanted to give you some examples of what these Betty numbers are. Um, so the first example is that if you look at the first Betty number of a sphere, uh, so of the ball, the two-dimensional sphere, it is 0. And this is because, as I said earlier, the ball, the two-dimensional sphere has a two-dimensional hole in the middle, not a one-dimensional hole. So it's B1 is 0. If I looked at B2, it would be non-zero. Um, but 
what happens if you try to do the same calculation for the space RP2, uh, real projected space uh, that I mentioned before? Well, something interesting happens, uh, which is uh, you get zero if P, the prime P is not two, but you get one if the prime P is two. And this is related to the fact that when I was trying to describe RP2, I said, you look at points on the ball and identify antipodal points. So two points were getting identified with one point. And the fact that the number two shows up there and the prime number P is two over here are related to each other in a way that I cannot explain uh, in this talk. But the practical consequence of all this is that since these two numbers are different, B1 of RP2 comma two is one and B1 of sphere comma two is zero, this proves for you mathematically that there's no way of taking RP2 and converting it into a sphere. There's no clever relabeling of one into the other. They're just not the same space. And this is a very useful uh, thing to know. So this is what cohomology does for you. And of course, this is an old notion. So in the years since, uh, we've come up with many, many more cohomology theories, depending on the kinds of spaces uh, you're looking at. OK, so in my final slide, I want to talk about what the prize recognizes. Uh, and so the main uh, accomplishment uh, that's being recognized by this prize is the creation of a new cohomology theory, which is called prismatic cohomology. Uh, this was joint work with uh, Matthew Morrow and Peter Schultz uh, dating back uh, to 2014, I guess is when we started. Um, and I will not tell you what it is, but let me at least tell you roughly what it's trying to do for you and the kinds of problems uh, it's solving. Um, so it's a new cohomology theory. Um, it does, it, like Betty's cohomology theory, it attaches numbers uh, to spaces, but the spaces of interest are now p-adic spaces. Um, so this is definitely something I cannot explain in this talk, but I want to point out that on the previous slide, I said that the prime number p and the space uh, x had nothing to do with each other in Betty's theory. But now the spaces we care about has something to do with the prime number p. They are p-adic spaces. Uh, and this kind of relationship between uh, the prime P and the space you're working with um, gives the theory a very different flavor and makes it much richer, in fact. Um, one thing you might be worried about is uh, if you sort of move to this exotic world of piatic spaces, you might lose the ones you care about, but actually you don't. So solution sets of, polynomial solution sets of polynomials with integer coefficients are naturally piatic spaces as well. So the spaces I care about are still in the mix. Um, what is it good for? Well, these p-adic spaces arise naturally in various parts of math, uh, as I've listed over here in algebra, topology, and number theory. And so each time you meet a p-adic space, now you have a new tool, uh, which is prismatic cohomology, and you might hope that the p-adic this tool will say something new about the space, and that's in fact what happens uh, in these examples. And so there are several um, theorems uh, in these subjects uh, that were inaccessible before, but are now uh, provable uh, thanks to this uh, new theory. And then finally. Uh, what this theory is actually doing is that it's merging all those other theories I had on the previous slide together into a single object. And so let me just give you a cartoon of what this theory looks like. Um, in Betty's theory, uh, there was a single parameter, which is this prime number p. Uh, now there is two parameters. There's a prime number p, and then there's an auxiliary variable t. And so prismatic cohomology lives on the p comma t plane. So it's a two-dimensional object. Uh, and what happens is that if you restrict to a one-dimensional subset of it, uh, like the t-axis, uh, here you recover Betty's theory, singular cohomology. On the p-axis, you recover something called crystalline cohomology. Over here, you recover something called the Ram cohomology, and so on. And roughly, the picture is that the region that I've shaded in yellow was the theories we knew about before. And the region in blue uh, is something new. And that's where a lot of the applications are coming from. Um, OK, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention.